Welcome to Green Building Matters, the podcast that matters for green building professionals. Learn insight in green buildings as we interview today's experts in lead and well. We'll learn from their career paths, war stories, and all things green, because green building matters. And now our host, and yes, he has every lead and well credential, here's Charlie Cicchetti. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. I'm your host, Charlie Cicchetti. And today we're joined by a green building specialist from Canada, actually from Toronto, Steve Kemp. Steve, thanks for joining us. Thanks. No problem. Glad to be here. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. Steve's a lead fellow. He's a professional engineer and more. And we're going to get into his story here in just a second. You know, Steve, here on the podcast, we we really want to start early in your career. Hey, where'd you grow up and, and then where'd you go to school? I grew up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, so um, small-ish city, but certainly the biggest city in the area. Did all my schooling there. I spent um, nine years in school, so undergraduates, uh, degrees in physics, then a undergraduate degree in engineering, and the opportunity came up to do a funded graduate work project that was in building energy, well, based on looking at low energy cooling, so some energy modeling and, and an investigation of how uh, new at the time, novel low energy cooling systems. Yeah, that's awesome. So you've been in Canada, it sounds like, your whole life. And, and what brought you to the Toronto area? Well, well a job, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, I was at the end of my graduate career. I wasn't quite sure what I was doing next. I did have an offer from the university to stay on as a researcher. But I found this tiny little firm on the internet. And this would have been 1997. So finding firms on the internet wasn't common. <laughs> You could probably find Nike and McDonald's, but not not local engineering firms. And um, they were dedicated to doing low energy buildings. And um, I first got the bug in high school. My parents were looking at buying a house and there was all these trade magazines around our home. We're looking at buying this new home. And at the time in Canada, R2000, which was a, uh, a building energy labeling program developed in the 1980s to cut the energy consumption of single family homes by 50%. So it was these magazines were, you know, they were talking about air tightness testing and energy modeling to develop the design, the benefits of the buildings being more airtight, more comfortable, less dust. So that's kind of where it started for me. And so when I found this firm, Intermodal, in uh, Kitchener, Ontario, I decided to send them a uh, unsolicited CV and cover letter. I think I sent it on a Thursday and I was absolutely shocked that when my phone rang on Monday. <laughs> well, that's how you got to do it. You got to be bold. And uh, as Wayne Gretzky says, right, you, you miss all the shots you don't take. So I love on your LinkedIn profile, though, Steve, uh, you know, you had already admitted here on the podcast, you were at university for a number of years, multiple mm-hmm. degrees. So it says obtain three degrees, but more importantly, scrub mortar off the brick of the new bar in the student lounge. Love it. <laughs> good time. Is that on the LinkedIn? I didn't know. I forgot I put that. <laughs> you must have some good humor in you. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So tell us, though, was there an aha moment for sustainability? You've already mentioned low energy was something mm-hmm. that uh, was around you at the time and that one of those early opportunities in your career. But was the word sustainability being used or more energy focus? Certainly um, through my training and school, it was it was definitely energy focused. When I came to Intermodal, they had already had a good track record. They had uh, uh, done the single family home that was energy and sustainability focused. Materials were very much a concern. They were looking at the embodied energy of, of even the concrete in the foundation that had gone with these precast ones that um, had used a lot less concrete in the foundation walls. There actually was a book written about that building in our own office at the time. They had just moved in this office that they had designed and built on their own. Someone else paid for it. It was a spec office building, but we were a tenant in it. And there was only about eight of us in the building, but I had just moved in the building. We had the contract to do the measurement and verification of that building's performance. And certainly the story of that building was about air quality. It was about uh, reducing construction waste. It was about uh, stormwater management. We had a stormwater management pond on site that doubled as a uh, our cooling tower, which was a failed experiment, I have to admit. (laughs) And so, you know, being around these people that had put so much time and thought about the design decisions that went into this building that we were in and working in, it certainly catches the bug. And uh, so this would have been the late 90s, early 2000s. So when LEED came out, we looked at LEED and went, this is what we're doing. (laughs) 
<laughs> the building we were in, we measured construction waste by bins, whereas lead, you know, and no one knew that was a, you know, we, two bins went to landfill. Is that good metric, a bad metric? We didn't know. It's a lot less than most buildings we knew. And so when thing, when something like lead comes around and starts codifying what is a good job, we saw the benefit of that to the marketplace. Yeah, it's good you're already doing it. So hopefully those early lead projects weren't like, oh, wow, what is this? And yeah, that <laughs> starts. So um, did anyone have an influence on you early in your career? Did you have any mentors? Well, it was certainly, as I mentioned, we started. I started this firm, Intermodal, which was, uh, I joined them in 1998 and stayed there until late 2015. Although at that time they had been bought by another firm. So it wasn't the same place anymore, but there was only eight of us when I joined and we grew it to 110. But of that original eight, there was very significant mentors. And Steve Carpenter, who is actually the first lead fellow in Canada, as well as uh, he's a, uh, has the order of Canada. He's retired, sort of, <laughs> still a good friend. Uh, we still see each other multiple times a year. John Coco, who was our sort of measurement guru and, and eventually started our commissioning group and uh, Richard Lay, who was our, our mechanical design engineer at the time, who was just really thoughtful. It was just a really fantastic group of people I had joined and uh, learned a lot from. All of them are mostly retired, but all still friends now. Well, wow, thanks for giving those shout outs. And, and yeah, sometimes with mergers and acquisitions, it uh, can be some rocket fuel, but you know, sometimes mm -hmm. culture changes and when it's all about getting bigger, it, it can be different. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some of your proudest achievements, uh, Steve, uh, work and personal so far? Um well, I, I'll focus on work first. Uh, a long time ago, well, not that long ago, uh, 2005, 6, 7, 8, Intermodal at the time, we were invited to help design a solar community. So this was in Alberta. I'd actually end up moving to Alberta for a couple of years. So it was a town called Okotoks, Alberta, just south of Calgary, uh, 52 homes. The design goal was to provide 90% of their heat from the sun. So it was a district energy system, lots of solar panels, solar thermal, not electric. So heating hot water, storing that hot water in, in tanks as well as in the ground. So we, we were heating the ground up and that was a, a design we took on and it actually measured in achieving 100%. So it's been a couple of winters now where none of the, uh, no gas was used to heat these homes. It was completely sourced by the sun. More recently, when I did, did leave my old firm, I decided to go to RDH because I believe the next phase of this high performance buildings is going to be very much enclosure folks. I mean, my education was mechanical engineer and I started in this uh, industry thinking, well, I'm a mechanical engineer, but you know, you got to solve where the heat demand, heating and cooling demands come from, which is the enclosure. And it didn't take as long as we were consulting with everybody that, wow, uh, mechanical systems were a mess. <laughs> it's, the industry just was not used to thinking about high performance, low energy mechanical systems. So I would say the early part of my career and to me, the early part of lead has definitely focused on improving mechanical systems, but we have not improved enclosures. So when I came to RDH, this was a firm that focused on enclosures. And so uh, my very first big project here was um, now called the Joyce Center for Innovation and Partnership. It's Mohawk College in Hamilton, Ontario. It was the day one of my job. We, we, I walked into the interview uh, to help win the project for our, our architect client, but the client wanted a net zero building. And that building is completed as of a week or two ago. Uh, classes have started in it. Oh, congrats. Um, we will be with it for the next two years as we measure the performance, but uh, everything followed through. So it's got a, a very high performance enclosure, triple glazed windows, modest amount of glazing, heat pumps that pull the heat of the ground for heating and dump and store heating, cooling, uh, you know, reject our cooling to the ground in, in the summertime. And, it, you know, it's just did everything that we've been saying. We, this is how you do it properly in cold climates for 30 years. And going back to my you know, high school with R2000, coming to fruition into a, a fairly large commercial institutional building. Hey, congrats. Now that's where you get to put all your masterpiece together. What well, sounds like a really cool project. Um, tell us a little more about uh, today. Fast forward to today. Uh, tell us a little bit about what RDH specializes in. I love the tagline, making buildings better. <laughs> so what's keeping you busy today? Anything else that you could talk about that your team's working on? Yeah, so we've we've been lucky so far in Ontario, which is I helped start this office here uh, two and a half years ago now, coming up on three years actually. And so we've been lucky to largely specialize on buildings that are targeting a very high performance, so net zero, near net zero, passive house. And as I mentioned, I mean to me, this is the 
RDH has been in business for 20 years, but they historically have concentrated on building enclosures, the building science part. So the keeping walls dry, how to detail them correctly so that they last long. It was all born out of, um, I'm not sure how much you were aware of it in the US, but there was this thing called the leaky condo crisis in Vancouver. Uh, so it's lots of lawsuits and it kind of changed the industry and spawned uh, a real resurgence in building science in Canada and certainly in, and even in the Cascadia region. So Seattle, Portland, and so on. So to me, this is the the next evolution of our sustainable buildings is, you know, getting back to that enclosure. We, we've spent 20 years improving our mechanical systems. And I'm a big fan of saying the better the enclosure is, the better the mechanical heating, cooling, environmental system you can put in. Because there are just some radiant cooling. The idea has been around a while, but if you have an all glass building with lots of sunlight coming in, it is really, it's almost impossible to apply radiant cooling to that type of enclosure, a building with that type of enclosure. You just can't get enough cooling out of it with that, those high a cooling load. But as the enclosure gets better, all these other things become available and more readily affordable because they're just, heating and cooling systems are just small. No, you're right. And, you know, down here, I'm in Atlanta in the southeast and say we're working on a school building, we'll go with the VRF systems and you just want to mm-hmm. just want to make sure we're using what we can, depending on our region there to max out that energy efficiency. But it sounds like obviously in your region, a lot more heating months than cooling months. It's different than some of us are used to. So it sounds like you're yeah. maxing it out, though. Yeah. Yeah, we're trying. <laughs> Good. Tell us a little bit about how the wellness real estate movement, uh, what are you seeing in your region there with uh, Well and FitWell? Are you guys working on any of those projects? We are. Usually not as the consultant that's helping them with that aspect of it. Uh, but we certainly have been involved on projects that are targeting Well. We have a renovation project here in Toronto. Not sure how much I can talk about it, but is is a complete gotten reskin of the building and they're targeting significant greenhouse gas emissions reductions. That's the metric they're using is greenhouse gases. Gotcha. As well as targeting well. Yep. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we're seeing more and more of the carbon conversation and some zero carbon buildings. And it's just it's exciting. You've been doing this a long time. I've been in this a while and it's there's all these different rating systems. So sometimes it's a little, uh, <laughs> a little exhausting. There's so many options, but uh, in a way it's good. There are options. You know, just each building's different. Each client's different. And mm-hmm. um, It's exciting. Let's talk a little bit about if we had a crystal ball, what should we be reading up on? What do you think's around the corner? Where's this green building movement shifting? Hmm. All good questions. I think you're right when you mentioned carbon is, I mean, that's ultimately what we're after, especially, you know, I think the pressing requirement is to address climate change. And uh, and certainly carbon is one of the biggest parts of that. We have some challenges around how we count carbon in the market. There's certainly lots of things out there you can use, but none of them are necessarily 100% correct. And it's inherently political. Carbon crosses, doesn't care about state and provincial or country boundaries whatsoever, doesn't care where you admit it. And our energy systems in North America are inherently linked. (laughs) I like to say that the hydropower in Quebec and Manitoba in Canada can readily offset coal power in Georgia, South Carolina. Uh, Virginia, it's, you know, it's all one grid. It's easy to send the, you know, shut, but then you're getting into local things. So you really, does Virginia really want to lay off a bunch of people in a coal plant (laughs) Um, so that they can buy power from across the international border? Uh, It's it's interesting. Uh, Even with like LEED, you know, there's obviously the Canadian Green Building Council and maybe some tweaks to some of the programs. There's the U.S. version of LEED and and then there's Energy Star that we use to benchmark our existing buildings. And it just went through some major changes on the existing building scoring. So, Mm -hmm. but you're right. We're going to be tied together with the grid and and the fossil fuels North America is using. So I I hear you on that front. Yeah. yeah. And honestly, I had this debate in committees ad nauseum (laughs) and I'm slowly coming to the point of view that because it's so political, we have to look at what the local politics are and how the local regions are trying to address their carbon emissions. Uh, That's a good point. And not to talk politics, but, you know, on national levels, there's initiatives, but it all, it's always going to come down to the local, regional, city. You know, for example, we do a lot of work in New York City and, you know, those local laws there coming out of the mayor's office. I mean, that's the most influential to our buildings, our design, the local code. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're right. It it makes sure we don't freak out at a high level instead, zoom in. What's happening at that kind of regional and city level just, just makes sense. Well, 
We've got a lot of credentials. One I want to talk about in particular is your professional engineer, your PE. I talked to a colleague uh, that I had on the podcast a few weeks ago, and I just I want to make sure, you know, you've got a mechanical engineering background after that physics degree. And uh, tell those listening, what has a PE done for you? Because I have some friends that are engineers, and they kind of poo-poo the idea of, of logging the hours and going for their PE. Uh, it's a very different context in Canada versus the U.S. Oh, okay. Educate us. Yeah, I'm not sure. So up in Canada, all of the engineers engineering degree granting schools have their program certified by a national professional engineering body. So the idea is that if you're certified, then your graduates, after two years of job experience and writing a an ethics and law exam, but not a technical exam, can receive their their pre-eng. Uh, at least it was two years when I graduated. Now it's, I think, up to four years. Uh, <laughs> but it is, I would say, in Canada, if you're working in the engineering, not, not lots of engineers graduate and don't necessarily work in the engineering field. They may work in policy or in something else. But if you're working in an engineering field, I, my guess would be 90% of engineering graduates in Canada get their pre-eng. Because it's not, it's a very different thing. Whereas the U.S., because the education system is not regulated by a central engineering body, then yeah, you have to demonstrate through some rather tough exams <laughs> and effort and time that you indeed have the qualifications to be a professional engineer. I didn't know that. Yeah. Very different system. Yeah. I appreciate you clearing that up. And again, congrats on your lead fellow. That's a huge deal. Well, let's talk about uh, what's your specialty? What's your gift? You know, this is a, a humbling question, but what, what, do you think, what do you think you're best at? <laughs> Oh, I mean, right now I'm concentrating on team building. I've yeah. um, switched firms. I'm slowly building a team around me. My management goal in life is to be redundant. <laughs> and so I guess within that context, I'm trying to develop a team around me that I guess has the technical chops in the room because we were ultimately usually not the design engineers of record for these buildings. We're helping uh, the, the architect with the enclosure. We're helping the mechanical designer with the mechanical systems, the electrical, with the lighting and electrical systems. We're certainly giving advice, certainly trying to understand how to impact, say, the lead score or whatever through the energy model. So we need that those technical chops, but we also need uh, that ability to work with design teams, uh, work with them effectively so that everyone achieves the end goal. And so you need to be sort of a, a jack of all trades, but master of none. Yeah. Well, I, I really commend you for being a good enough leader to realize that you do want to make yourself redundant. I think many fear that. It's like, well, I don't want to make myself replaceable. Well, no, you want to free up your time so that you can work on the business. You can work on strategy. You can work on offense. You need to not be down mm -hmm. in the trenches all the time. So I applaud you that you realize, no, you, you need to make sure that uh, you're building a good team around you. I know you're on the energy side, the sustainability side, the performance side, but can we talk a little bit about envelope commissioning? Maybe just, just for a second. I believe your firm does some of this work when it comes to the mm -hmm. building envelope. Uh, it's lead version four yep. on the new construction side has introduced this more to our buildings uh, in Washington, D.C. The new building codes coming out are going to require certain size buildings to do envelope commissioning. What's mm -hmm. your take on it? We, for strange enough, uh, we sat down in our firm a year ago as all this stuff was coming out and tried to ask ourselves, what does that mean to us? Because we, especially on the West Coast, and the West Coast is a different scenario in that because it's, it's you know, the whole, I mean, starting from now, it's September, October until much next spring, it's going to be almost constant constantly raining there, which means everything gets wet. And the biggest failure path for our materials in the building enclosure is they get wet and don't dry out. And a lot of the rest of the country in North America, we have long enough periods of warmer and drier weather that even if there is a leak, it, it dries out. So the West Coast is a the Pacific Cascadia region is a particular challenging climate with respect to that enclosure. So most of the municipalities, um, Vancouver, Portland, Seattle have developed codes around making sure that enough commissioning, they didn't, they didn't actually even start calling it commissioning, but enough design detail and site reviews go into the design and construction of the building envelope, the building enclosure to ensure that it's going to be durable and, and last. And so the biggest difference, and so we were doing that already. And for clients outside of that region, that especially if they were institutional monumental buildings, you know, the ones you're expecting, everyone's expecting the last 50 to 100 years, we would be hired outside of that region to do those things as well. So the bigger difference to, we ask ourselves, what is the difference between what we're doing now versus what is commissioning? And really it's just layering on the reporting and uh, so there's a little more, you know, as the definition of commissioning exists through NIBS, 
and ashrays double zero that that lead references. Uh, really, it just brings in a greater level of reporting onto the work that we are already done, doing. And then the big next challenge with, or at least the next thing that professionals have to ask themselves when it comes to commissioning the building envelope for lead or any project is every project's different. If you did everything in those guidelines, NIBS and ASHRAE double zero, and every little project, you would bankrupt your client. You can't do everything that those guidelines ask you to do. You have to look at those and understand the context of the project and what activities need to be done. You're absolutely right. Well, let's share some more best practices here, uh, some pro tips. You know, you're a busy guy. Uh, leading a team, growing an office, growing a company. What's some of your best practices when it comes to staying productive, staying successful? Any routines or rituals? Oh, wow. <laughs> Let's see. I mean, you always try to create your to-do list for the week on Monday, especially so you not end up faffing around. And so you try to keep that on front of you. So that, that's certainly one easy one. I, in terms of my staff and people, and quite frankly, RDH in general takes us to heart, don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> Meaning the you know little small expenses and internal things you do spend money on. Really, it's about trying to keep a, a cohesive team and a staff together. And we keep our sights on what our goals are for what we're trying to do. You know, we're not trying to chase after every little project. We're trying to go after projects that match our sensibilities, our aspirations. Uh, that's why I've been lucky enough in the last two years to concentrate just on high performance buildings, buildings that are targeting net zero lead platinum and, and incorporate the energy performance with the enclosure performance. So nice. You're right. It's focused. There's so much opportunity and the economy's good and you could try all these different things, but it's really about the things we say no to, right? So that's, that's pretty mm. cool. Thanks for sharing. Yep. Books. I don't know if you listen to books, you like to pick up a hard copy, but is there a book or two you'd recommend to those listening? I didn't read that far enough ahead in your questions. We want to strike that one out. <laughs> no problem. Um, but ironically, it's an old book that I actually was just talking about over drinks last night with a couple of clients, nice. uh, architect clients. For those of us who are working on the technical side, there are some good sort of architecture focused books. Not well, not quite architecture focused, but type of books that a lot of your clients may be reading. And it's I find it's always good to read some of them. So one of my favorites is How Buildings Learn, which is uh, a book by Stuart Brand. Stuart Brand was also responsible for the Whole Earth Catalog. But his this book was just talking about how buildings change over time and that we, especially in this world that we're mostly looking at new construction, are we really thinking about what this building is going to be like in 10, 15, 20, 30 years, how it will be used, how it will change. And so it's a really, it's a, to me, it was a really fascinating book. Because I think one of the next big challenges we have is what are we going to do about all these existing buildings? Right. Yeah, no, it's, we do a, a fair amount of e-bomb work and it's, uh, you're right. The new construction codes are pushing us towards net zero for anything out of the ground, which is awesome. Maybe mm -hmm. regenerative design after that, but the existing building stack is, uh, it's good. There's some transparency laws in certain cities, but, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of catching up to do on those big mm -hmm. existing buildings. So I love uh, that book. I'm going to check it out, How Buildings Learn, and we'll put the link here in the show notes. Um, you know, Steve, anything you wish you'd have known a little earlier in your career? Oh, that's if I can say this right. Earlier in my career, especially when you're being brought in, sometimes it feels like the hired gun to help the design team improve the design to achieve that lead goal or whatever the environmental standard they're reaching for is. And you're looking over the design and you're sitting down having to have an argument with a mechanical engineer, an architect who uh, often had 20 years more experience in the industry than you did, but of course was doing things the way they'd always done it. And also they had, you know, you came out of nowhere and they already had uh, six months with this project. So had a, I being charitable, I certainly have to admit they have a better understanding of the context of the particular project. So coming as a hired gun, you're like sitting there going, well, you got to do it this way. And, and these are the reasons. And, you know, you would lay out the technical reasons and benefits of looking at it in a different way and then walk out and nothing would change. And but I eventually had I known and, and realized and an early advice that I, I now give my staff is more decisions happen outside of that meeting room than you think. <laughs> and reaching out to those decision makers before the meeting happens, let them know what you're thinking. So it's not a big surprise in the meeting room and getting in much, much earlier in the decision making process are vitally important. So I'm always surprised at how early decisions in any building projects stick, rightly or wrongly, but the ones that are made in the first month often stick. 
a lot and get followed through again, rightly or wrongly. So being a part of that decision process very early is important and understanding that, especially when it's a new, a new design team you haven't been involved with before coming into the meeting, like a bull in the China shop is never an effective way to change minds. <laughs> Even if you have all the technical backing and, and analysis in the world that supports your position, those side conversations before that helps everyone buy into a new solution are critically important. Yeah. Wow. That is good advice. You know, Steve, I've learned a lot and uh, I really appreciate you being on the podcast. Uh, keep doing what you're doing with high performance and net zero buildings and uh, keep adding to the green building movement. Congrats on your lead fellow and everything else you've done. And, and just, yeah, thanks for being on the podcast today. Yeah, no problem. It was fun. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. At GBES.com, our mission is to advance the green building movement through best-in-class education and encouragement. Remember, you can go to GBES.com slash podcast for any notes and links that we mentioned in today's episode. And you can actually see the other episodes that have already been recorded with our amazing guests. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Tell your colleagues And if you really enjoyed it, leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on next week's episode.